Welcome to another edition, another episode of Sports Card Insights from uh, from me. I'm here with Rich Klein again. Uh, Rich uh, and I enjoy talking about the uh, hobby, about the industry. We especially, I think, are enjoying reminiscing uh, not just about the good old days, but about some of the, the, the great people. And we've done uh, a number of these uh, tribute issues. This is one that we don't, I don't know that we planned this before uh, the National, but I think uh, Dan even had been in, in, in bad health, but uh, I used, used to see him at the National, and he actually passed away on, the I think, the Friday of the National here in 2019 in, in Chicago. And that was that was sad, but uh, he'd been in bad health. His wife was uh, was there. Um, but, but before we get into the particulars and uh, converse about that, uh, the first thanks to our sponsors, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Panini, Tops, and Upper Deck. Thanks to the sponsors. Uh, Rich, uh, sad day. Dan Even, a really good guy, had a, a great sense of humor, a clever guy, uh, kind of had his own niche in the industry. Um, what, what was your take on that? Well, it's always sad when a good person, and Dan was invaluable to us when we were doing the Almanac. Every year, he'd make sure we got all the checklists and as many types as he could find for, for all the postcard samples. So we had a really good, solid postcard checklist of all the current years, and he would help fill in the previous years as well. And, you know, we were talking about his sense of humor. Google Dan even obituary, and you will read one of the funniest obituaries you'll ever see in his life. It truly was a celebration of what he is, and there was a great line in there. And he's left us with all sorts of stuff, such as RC cola cans from the 1970s. We have no idea what to do with. You and I are the only two people that read that and know exactly what he was talking about. You know, I'm pretty sure that he he wrote that. I would before. guess he wrote that too. Uh, and I, I have a, uh, an older friend who passed away uh, 10 years ago who did that. Actually, gave a video obituary that was played at his at his uh, at his funeral, at his memorial service. But Dan was a was a I, I don't know that he was a joker, but he was just, just a clever, uh, funny guy. And uh, but I always thought he was more of a paper collector than a card collector. He was both. I mean, he was postcards, and you know. I'm sitting here, and one, one, one thing that people don't know is when I come to your house and we tape this, we also go through some of, some of your cards, and we sort them, and we figure out where to put them. <laughs> and we do player, you're doing player collecting today. We're doing player collecting. And you had a bunch, maybe 40 or 50, of the 86 Cunningham cards, which were beautiful cards. They were full bordered. They were color photos. They were accessible. A superstar is accessible to collectors at a regular price. Of course, it helps that they, nobody paid a license. Well, they just say, how many do you want? Don't just print up that many, but, uh, but they were well done. They, they were well done. nothing wrong with them other than they weren't licensed. Right. And that's a, that's obviously a bit of a problem. <laughs> you know, when the licensors want you, that's, that's a bit of a real problem. But one thing Dan did is about 1990, and we were searching for this, and I'm 99% sure I'm correct. Dan actually did a checklist of rotor cards that he publishes a book. I think it may have been seven or ten dollars. It was not very expensive. It was not a big money making venture. But it, it wasn't was, a price guide, I don't yeah, think. It was a really. checklist. Yeah, and, it showed and the pictures. Showed the pictures. Yeah. Was, you know, yeah. and, it, and, you know, and today, if you think about it, it's actually a great resource in a different way. If you don't know if the card you're holding was licensed or not, you know, in case, obviously, it's not going to have the logos, but then you can refer to that book. Okay, it's in that book. It's definitely not a licensed card. It's not something I want to put up for sale because it's not something I'm comfortable, or I'll put it in my quarter bin where if somebody buys it, it's not a big deal. Was it Scott Cunningham? Scott Cunningham yeah, was his and he name. was uh, but the the category is uh, referred to generally as Broder Broders, cards, correct? But that came from Rob Broder, but really came from Ed Broder. Right. Ed was the dad, was a photographer, I think, on the West Coast, correct? And maybe some military yeah. moving around. So he had he was an accomplished photographer, and I, I don't I think he, he had some sets back in the he had 70s sets in the that 70s. were his own. He had like a um, Mets tour of Japan yeah, yeah. set. He has so there was a theme to it, but then and I don't know that Rob was his son or his. Not alter ego, but I mean that there was. Uh, I don't know that Ed wasn't still the one doing the photos. From what I heard, it was Ed still doing yeah. the photos. But anyway, so they became generically known as Broders, and they were out there, and people wanted us to list them in the price guide. And of course, the leagues and players associations who had not been paid didn't really uh, want us to do that, even though there was precedent that there there are other cards, you know, older cards that weren't, weren't uh, fully licensed. But uh, Dan did a service to at least tell it like it is. And uh, that was helpful for us, and we could point uh, people to that. But I, I always thought he was a pretty selfless guy. He really was. He it's wasn't like trying to build an empire because he, he he literally, I believe, could have cornered them. Maybe he did corner the market for for Cardinals postcards. 
I mean, he was yeah, he, he had was the lots guy. of team postcards. He had I, th- I think he had big stash of Orioles and Cardinals and and I just remember going to his table. And the problem with postcards that Dan again being like us a little bit you know loving the sport too. They're blank backed in many cases. Sometimes they have a postcard back, but sometimes the team issues are just a blank back, and you have no way of knowing if there's not a year on there other than having an acquaintance with what player played when. And then some of them were reissued, but he always had a good nature about him that he wasn't, uh, I don't know that he wasn't obsessive, but he wasn't obsessive in a way, you know, because he was, he was a serious student of that, and he published his findings, but uh, pretty easygoing guy, I think. Yeah, so he was, it was always a blast to talk to him. And one thing Dan did, and it wouldn't make the National any money next year. And I don't know if there's room for it in the Atlantic City Convention Center or whatever building they had. But Dan used to run what they called Stadiaplex or helped run that in terms of the National, which was basically a separate postcard show. Yeah. Even if the only person who attended was me, which actually happened one year. <laughs> you know, it was fun to see and talk to the people who had the passion for postcards. It was almost like you could do a seminar during the show for postcards. And I think that would be a nice tribute. It would be a nice tribute to him, yeah. Of course, uh, there's, you know, uh, Dan even, uh, there's going to still going to be an even uh, contribution to the national. His his wife, whom I've always called Janice, but is, uh, I believe, Janice, but I've known her almost as long. They were always at the shows together, right. and she's been very involved with the national. I, I used to get letters from her, I mean, just, you know, from uh, yeah. from my national involvement. Uh, she was the secretary, I think, of the NFCC. Yeah. Now, she was very involved, in fact, she wanted to fulfill her duty so badly this year that she came to the National until she got the word she had to go back home. Yeah. But she wanted to honor her commitment to the National, and she could have stayed home this year. And I, I think part of me wishes she had stayed home, well, but part of me understands she wanted to be part of the thing of the organization she has spent so much of her life helping. Well, that's 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 dedication. That's that's admirable. Like I said, Dan, I, I always felt he was more of a giver than a taker, and in a in an industry, a hobby where there's a uh, can be a lot of money changing hands. It's it's uh, nice to see a guy like that, and it's sad, sad to see him uh, gone. You know, when we, you know, when we were talking about this, we looked up, and there's a brief thread on Net fifty on the Net fifty four message board about him, and some of the people who are mentioned are really some of the old timers of the right, hobby that right. really, you know, were selfless like that. There was Steve Mitchell who Steve did Mitchell. a publication called Sports Scoop. Sports Scoop. I was a subscriber, and that was like 1973, 1974, yeah, and yeah. one of the main. Focuses of that Let's publication. Earl Averill into the, the Hall of Fame, fame and yeah. he succeeded. And not the <laughs> Earl Averill Jr. <laughs> if you got a 59 tops card. But, uh, and Bob yeah. Thing is, Bob, Bob Thing, Thing, Thing is, is mentioned. another postcard guy from, uh, from Maine. Right. And Bob Thing is one of the old line dealers. And I mean, he's always has those small sets and supplies and right. things. Yeah. But he's hasn't been around for a while. He's still, I mean, he was on that thread. So he's still around. He just doesn't. No, but not around the visibly. national. I don't yeah, think he's, yeah. I don't think he does a national. I think that may be too much to carry at this point of his life. But, you know, I'm, I wonder if Bob thinks so at least does like the greater Boston, the big maybe, greater Boston maybe. shows, which aren't that far away from him. I remember he had a kind of a heavy table. Yes. You know, if you know what I mean. And nowadays, if you've got a lot of weight, you can't fly and you got to drive. You maybe have to bring a trailer. I don't know. It's uh, it's tricky. The industry's uh, evolved. And uh, depends yeah, we on we have a lo- We have a local dealer and he worked an arrangement out with one of his customers where the guy drives the material to the national. The guy's going to the national anyway, so oh. he basically gets recompense, gas, yeah, gas, gas money, and other ways of getting into the show. And he brings the bring st- along. Yeah. to bring, and he's coming anyway to the national, and he's got a somewhat flexible schedule. So he's he's in the food catering business. So he he just takes a couple weeks off from what he does, and yeah, he just, goes drives to the national, sees family in Cincinnati, and basically he gets paid for doing what he would want to do anyway. Uh, do you think Dan even you know again this is a again we're we delightful guy. Did he make money at the National? I don't, I, th- I, I don't, I, I don't think, so. think he did. I'm just thinking he came. He's with friends. He was not behind his table all the time. I don't know if it was untended at times, but it, he'd be out there. And I'm, he, did, he didn't bring, like I said, a heavy, he didn't bring t- tons of material. He brought stuff. He put it out. And I think he took a lot of it back. You and I would pick up stuff for types, for, for cataloging uh, over the years. But I think he just was there as an excuse to get get out with and with his wife, I think they seem to be very congruent, and, um, and so it's very pleasant. He wasn't stressed to figure out, hey, I'm not making my table money or something and this like is that. one of the hidden secrets Don't of the think? national. Yeah. The board members are paying for their tables too. Yeah, it's not like the board members are living high on the lot hog. You're getting free tables. Most of them are doing it just for the love of the hobby. Love, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot to be said for the people on the NSCC board. They're not they're not getting free booths. They're not getting free anything. They're basically working just as hard. 
you know, as everybody else, and they're working harder to help you and me. Well, I think, uh, again, it's a, in most industries, there, there are a few people that serve, and uh, there, there are a lot more uh, takers than givers, and, and, and Dan and Janice were, uh, were, were givers. I, I, you know, I, I, I started out being a giver. I still think I am, but, you know, it, it, it's not that it invalidates it, the fact that I did a publication and it made money. Because when I first started, I didn't know if it was going to make money. It did make money. But Dan even did, did uh, maybe a couple publications. He, he did, he did, did. the Broder one. I think he did a postcard thing, too. He certainly did postcard so, stuff. Basically, and I promise you, those were most likely labors of love. You know, I, I, like I said, my, my publications could have been that. You just don't know. Postcards are, uh, it's, it's almost not even a subset of sports cards because it's, it's very separate. They have their own shows. And there's some sports in there, but most of it is not sports. And there's a local, and there's a local postcard show I go to in Dallas. Yeah. And it's not really related to sports postcards. Maybe once out of every four shows, I'll buy something at the Dallas Postcard Show, which is in oh. the same hotel that I run my shows in. Okay. But, you know, and the guy, Jim Taylor, who runs it is very good. But, you know, as I said, it's hit or miss for me at those shows, getting anything sports related yeah. to deal with. But yeah. the postcard hobby is certainly a separate hobby, but it was one of the great things with the National. There was a place for postcards, and there still is a place for our, postcards. Our, our primary overlap with Dan and interest and, and, and real connection when we visited with him for extended periods of time was on the player postcards or the, or the, 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 play, the team yeah. issue uh, card. And, the, and like we've said with some other things, it basically, if those had been two and a half by three and a half, Dan would have been doing a lot more business, and he'd have been the guy, and everybody would have gone through him for those. Uh, but since they were oversized a little bit and blank-backed, they were. They didn't get the the full respect. They, they except are, from us, I but think. They're, they're cool. Yeah. Cards. Hey, and they were great to have. Yeah, and they were another fun thing to catalog. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you get players from teams that you wouldn't have otherwise. Well, thanks, Rich. Thanks for a chance to to reminisce about uh, a great uh, a great uh, gentleman in the in the industry who's again untimely passing. We'll we missed him this year. We'll miss him next year. And uh, our condolences to his uh, widow Janice. So again, thanks for being here, Rich. Thanks for listening. Uh, all of y'all who love uh, cards like we do. And we'll be back tomorrow. Thanks. The man in the house of cards.